not one to do trash talk. That's just not my personality. Oh, I was going to ask you for what. <laughs> give me some of your. Give me some of your best trash. I, talk. I have none. This week on Backward Compatible, Jam, Doc, and Chris discuss how the land party has evolved with shifts in technology and culture. Plus, Assassin's Creed Origins, disciplinary controversies in the Overwatch League, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 125 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy, howdy. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today's going to be an interesting talk. We're discussing uh, kind of the concept of the LAN party, something that was a little bit more prominent kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, where you'd get a bunch of people together and you would play, you know, a computer game sort of all in the same place on a local area network. Um, and how that's kind of evolved over time with new technology and with changes in the gaming culture, even changes in the games themselves uh, into something of a new form that we don't call land parties uh, necessarily most of the time. Um, but we have kind of like different things that sort of resemble those um, and to what extent they might actually um, be more prevalent than we think or maybe they aren't um, going to some definitions. It should be fun stuff. I always thought it stood for loud and noisy party. Yes, that is definitely what it stands for. But first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. All right, so I finally swung by my dad's house and picked up his copy of Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, You know I'm a fan. My dad's a bigger fan. Uh, He's also like uh about to turn 70 so uh just to put that into perspective take that for what you will yeah uh and and he's pastor so (laughs) you know uh but he loves the he loves the series loves the series and um i you know i do too i i know quite a bit about the series and i think that i can speak with authority whenever i say that uh origins is self-aware in a good way for example it knows that it needs to have templar but it can't so what does it do? It it has the uh, the cult of the ancients. And why can't it have Templar? Well, because it is set uh, basically in the uh, later, much, much, much later Egyptian Empire, uh, Cleopatra's times. So it's basically whenever the Greeks were in the process of taking over Egypt, and that causes the strife. It's actually a great political backdrop. So to put it into perspective, the pyramids, for example, there was more time between when the pyramids were built and Cleopatra than there is between Cleopatra and us today. So within the context of the game, which is literally the oldest setting that's ever been in the, uh, you know, AC world, it is still, you're looking at these ancient ruins called the pyramids. Okay. So the, the whole, the whole landscape is riddled with ancient ruins that have been reclaimed by the desert. And that's kind of the setting. And yet it's still, there's this sort of idyllic, um, almost oasis, like, uh, man is involved in reclaiming the desert. You know, there's this, this one city that they're trying to take back because it's an old holy city. Um, and they want to revitalize it and that kind of a thing. And so there's very much a, a man versus nature kind of theme in this thing. You could be walking along and get attacked by a lion that that's not something that I remember experiencing before. So they're aware of this. Like I said, it's a very self-aware uh, entry in the series. You aren't an assassin to begin with. You're a killer and there's a difference and you're out for vengeance because, and I'll give a few spoilers. Uh, so spoiler alert, uh, early on you find out your son was killed by apparently this weird cultist in as part of a ritual, uh, but also the government. And so you're like, I'm going to kill these guys who are responsible for that. And so you're after them. And then there's this beautiful moment where you're like, you've, you've taken out two of them. One of them was literally the opening scene. So it almost doesn't count, uh, but you've taken out the second one. And then you meet up with your wife in Alexandria, which by the way, amazing, beautiful, wonderful rendition of that city. Totally 
outstanding. The you know the Library of Alexandria, the Lighthouse of Alexandria. Uh, I mean, I feel like I understand that place now. Um, but just like all the other entries, I, I've been there. You know what I mean? Uh, and so when when you get there and you meet up with your wife, she's like, "And I killed these two. And then sort of in the menuing screen, it X's them out. You as the player don't do this. Hmm. But then as it is with the animus, um, because that's the, the sort of the meta story, um, there's a woman who's trying to get her way back into Abstergo, which in and of itself is kind of funny because Abstergo is the Templar. They're the so-called bad guys. And so everything you're doing to learn this ancient origin of the, uh, you know, uh, of the assassins you're doing so that you can get back in good with the bad guys. It's so ironic. And I, I really am interested in how that's going to end. Um, but she then realizes uh, through the bleed through effect, which is a thing. Um, and uh, she's been using the mummy DNA of the main character that his wife is also buried here in the tomb. And so he goes and he, and she finds uh, that, and then she plugs it in and the person she's communicating with is, which is all, it's also kind of a, uh, an icon of the genre is like, uh, Oh yeah, well, it's going to take a while for that DNA to process. And when it does happen, you're going to have some serious crossover. And I'm still not at that point yet narratively. So yes, I have climbed the pyramids. I have synchronized the pyramids. It took hours and hours and hours of gameplay to be able to even get to Giza, by the way. Um, I, I am deeply immersed in this massive, massive world. The cities feel like cities from the other games. The open lands feel like open lands. Um, it almost feels like uh, The Witcher 3 in its um, implementation. And, and I think oh, send, some... send all of your hate mail to I'm, t- I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, 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 I think, is a beautifully done rendition of the series, which, like I said is self-aware. It knows that when it puts a thing on a screen and it says, this is going to be the person that you kill, this is your, your final, uh, your boss or whatever. And then it denies you that, that you're going to be like, wait, wait, what? And then it gives you the, the, the wife as a playable character. And then it denies you that you're gonna be like, wait, what? So that when you do get the chance to do those things, even if it resets your XP, which I don't think it's going to, but even if it does, I'm going to be like totally fine with it. So I am, I would say about 12 hours in, uh, but the way I play these games is I kind of conquer an area before I move on narratively. So I'm going to, I'm going to be a hundred, 120 hours in before I beat this thing. Um, I'm at a reasonable level. I have not over leveled, which is so much fun. Um, even having done all of that, that I am super excited. So uh, plan to hear a little bit more about origins uh, in, in future episodes, because I'm going to keep playing it. I am having incredible fun with it. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So over this past weekend at the time of recording, some friends and I got online to play some Overwatch. And typically what you do when you uh, sort of stack up with people, um, get into a group and go queue up, is you're getting queued up with the matchmaking system online to play against, you know, random opponents who also happen to be online. But what we decided to do this time is actually we gathered um, a bunch of people together. We got 12 people together, uh, which was very hard to schedule because we had some people over in Europe and some people on the East Coast. And of course, it's the weekend and we're all adults and we all have our own different plans and obligations. Um, But we managed to bring together 12 people at the same time to hop online and play um, private scrimmages. Um, So we actually played like with, uh, you know, competitive style rules. Um, This is something that actually pros do um, when they're practicing with their teams. Like they go up like their team against either another like sort of B team or they'll go up against uh, another team entirely. So did you make that term up or are you using an industry term now? Um, I'm not sure. Like they don't call it scrimmages necessarily in Overwatch, Uh but that's a concept that's been around. For a okay. while. It's not something that we made up. Okay, so it's part it's part of the league culture now. More or less. Yeah. All right, gotcha. But yes, yeah, so it was actually a lot of fun because what what tends to happen is when you get a six stack together, six like the full six people to make up a team, and you go queue up against people, you tend to have very disparate um, skill levels. And because not everyone will actually get into a full team of six, you tend to run into people that are all better, all, all higher level than you, all more skilled, all more coordinated. And so it's not like this very fun experience to actually get in, get into a team of six and go do this. But because we all kind of knew each other and because we were able to kind of let, let things balance out such that there was more or less an even matchup, um, we actually were able to have this great experience of playing six v six. That's an interesting disclaimer. <laughs> over comms and over um, 
being able to actually like experience kind of this sort of competitive style play in a more approachable and less like it's not going to hurt your record because it's all just, you know, friendlies. Um, it, it was just a really neat experience, I think. Um, the other thing we were able to do is after the fact, um, we had a few people drop out. So we started switching up game modes and we started doing some custom matches with special rules. Um, one that was particularly funny is you turned the gravity down quite a bit, um, increased the movement speeds considerably. And it was kind of, I forget if there's a term for it, but there's some other game mode that someone made up where um, you have a team of like two Reinhards, two or three Reinhards, um, and then uh, five or six Genjis. And all, the Genjis can only use their melee attack. They don't have any other attacks. And Reinhards don't have anything except their charge. Uh, and so you have like this really fun thing where you're sort of like jumping through the air and trying to like in midair sort of like charge into someone, pin them against a wall, that sort of thing. Moon mode. It, it was uh, quite amusing, and especially because a few people who were playing on the Genji side were kind of like uh, likening it to a horror movie experience. So, oh, like, goodness. you have like this giant thing like flying at you. It's and coming. It's, at ba- me. it's basically like a one hit kill on this small little map. And so, um, that was a lot of fun. It was a neat experience. I think it's something we're going to start doing more regularly now. And uh, it, it was interesting for me, too, because I've, I consider myself a decent player at my level. Um, we were going up against a lot of people who are much more skilled than I am. But again, because you've got a team with like kind of a good mix of high and low pl- level players, um, we were able to kind of balance things out overall. The matches are more or less even. Um, but I was also able to get some experience with um, playing against people of a higher skill level than I am so that I could start improving a little bit. Because the way you get better is to play people who are better than you. Well, sure. And so that was a really cool thing to do. Like, I I got wrecked <laughs> the first few matches we played. Um, but then as I started to settle, sort of settle into, like, the, the way that they were playing and getting to play different characters that I was a little bit better at, that sort of thing, um, it turned into, like, a really neat experience. It was a lot of fun to play, like, even when you were losing. How'd you do team chat? You could either use the built-in functionality if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. What we ended up doing actually was uh, we had a Discord server. Sure. Um, so actually, the the bulk of the people that were uh, participating are uh, fans or friends of fans of this one streamer yeah. uh, on Twitch. And so it was kind of like that sort of gaming community based in that fandom. Um, and so we had a couple of different channels in Discord where people, if they switch teams, would sort of switch channels. Okay. And that's how we did it. So it wasn't an open channel for all the players? or mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't expect there to be for what you're describing. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Well, uh, Chris, I'm, I'm glad you talked about Overwatch League and in particular had a Get Wrecked segment because I want to talk a little bit about um, Blizzard's current and new policy and some of the controversy that it's um, demonstrated. And in fact, if you use that term, get wrecked, um, in a game, possibly as you were streaming, say, Overwatch, and the wrong person saw it, you might actually be banned or at least suspended temporarily from Overwatch based on this new policy if it was considered offensive. I don't think get wrecked would be. Now, if it was somehow like um, associated with like a racist meme sure. or something like that. I'm using possibly. it as an example, mm-hmm. as a segue. Yeah. You, you see where I'm going with this, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I have to segue into it somehow. I was trying to make a natural segue. Mm-hmm. Don't be too literal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I did want to kind of talk a little bit about this. And for those that haven't heard, um, Blizzard is released essentially um, a statement about their new policy that has affected some Overwatch League players. And I do want to... Um, point out one of them in particular here in a minute but the gist of it is uh they have a a, their new policy is focused on what they consider toxic behavior which they've tried to define but it's it's still a pretty broad category so they're banning all all the teenagers that might almost be a good thing but no uh (laughs) it's they're actually they're banning people for for what they consider behaviors that might be detrimental to the gameplay experience of others which um Unfortunately, uh, that's a very subjective thing <laughs> when you is, say yeah. that. Um, and and as coming from someone that has has played online games since essentially the beginning of online games, and Doc, you probably were the oh, same yeah. way. Um, that's part of the experience of online games. You just kind of you learn to deal with it, and you figured out a way around it. Now, um, I'm not, of course, suggesting people should be openly, um, you know, racist and hateful. However, yes, uh, what be secretly racist and hateful. Sure, what have you. But uh, Blizzard is um, actually looking at people outside the game space itself that might be uh, using social media to share, specifically, by the way, um, sharing memes or actually posting, even posting images that they might view as racially disparaging. And the problem is Blizzard, at least the people that are, that are policing this, don't seem to actually understand what they're criticizing. For example, and you are probably aware of this person, um, 
in Overwatch League, Dallas Fuels, Felix XQC, yeah. Lingyell. Um, he no, no was no longer with the Fuel after a second suspension. Yes. So yeah. he was suspended at, for four matches and fined $4,000, which for using, quote, a an emote during a stream that is deemed racially disparaging. Now I heard about this. Now this, by the way, for anyone that has any understanding of internet culture, this is not a racially disparaging meme. And I'm saying this not as a subjective... I'm saying this as a fact, as someone that actually understands how the internet works and how memes work. What he used was he shared a um, the um, the tryhard meme, which essentially is calling the the other team or the players a tryhard, which is like saying that they're they're working too hard at portraying a certain image that they're actually good at something when they're not. It's essentially it's contrived. It's like a an faker. emote, an in-game emote. It's a picture. He it's, shared a picture. It's like a Twitch chat thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a Twitch chat. Twitch, Twitch, oh. Twitch stream. Twitch chat okay. is already. It wasn't even really on the game. So it's really open-ended. It's yes. not. It's not a closed system. It's an open system. Yes, and he and he po- essentially shared an an image of this meme. Now, of course, the way the way the memes work is just a picture. In this case, it's a picture of uh, the streamer Trihex. So his face and uh, making like a like smiling, but has like this kind of like um, sort of like silly, confused expression on his face. And it became it, right. I mean, you're a little bit aware the, the, of this. This spot. is and this is and one I, of those I things, don't follow the streamer, by the way. Yeah, I've the, seen the meme all over the place, but I never actually knew. This who is also like one of those weird things where um, in this particular case, and this is my understanding, I'm not sure I'm not entirely sure it's accurate, but um, the try hard meme is not inherently racist but there's a specific context or usage of it like try hard seven if you add a seven at the end sure but that's more specific but you can do that you could do you can use anything within the wrong context yeah and that's not what he did and i, I forget exactly what he did in this case um i've heard that he actually used try hard seven or he used it at a time that's implied it was racist and that was another thing too is like recently someone else got suspended or fined for using uh the pepe meme Yes, I know, um, which, which by, is associated with alt-right yeah, except political the, except stuff. The problem is, no, it's not. This is, again, this is like something that they don't understand. What mm-hmm. hap- pep, The Pepe meme has been around long before the alt-right was even a and that, thing. That was, that's what I was so it's mention. nonsense to go, yeah. well, uh, some people in the alt-right use this meme. So what? Mm-hmm. So have so many people that are in no way associated with it long before the alt-right existed. Mm-hmm. So then to say, well, you can't use it anymore because one, one two, three, however many people that – that have this certain set of political views used it. Now you can't use it anymore. Mm. That's bullcrap. Yeah. And I think that this is where things get really tricky because I see where Blizzard, what, what they're trying to accomplish with this. They're trying to hold their players to a standard that it's very high. Um, now they might not be doing it in a very consistent way and that's problematic. Um, and I also think that they're tending to err on the side of if there's a question, if it could be possibly taken this way, they're going to assume that it is going to be taken that way. And they're trying to, um, now some people sort of said it's a little bit SJW. I personally no, think it's that's, a lot. It's a lot. It, it is it's a lot. SJW. I personally think that's not inherently a bad thing. Like I some, disagree. For some people say it's a dirty term. I think that there are a lot of people who have good intentions behind it. Um, I think that sometimes it gets taken too far and sometimes it's a little bit irrational, but the general movement toward, um, if you will, political correctness is not an inherently bad thing. So let me let me say this just to kind of close this segment, Chris. Um, my view on political correctness is that it is essentially. It is putting sanctions on free speech and freedom of expression, regardless of how you want to paint it. That's what you're doing. And uh, you talk about good intentions. Well, I do believe that this is true, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I say that I know it's I know it's a <laughs> I know it's a, uh, a a funny little phrase, but I actually believe that it is true. I understand that that they may have the best intentions, but I don't feel that they even have the ability, the capability to effectively determine what is and is not actually um hateful and racist no, and society going to determines co- that. Society determines that over a long period of time. Um, I mean, we can look at the history of all swear words, for example, and understand sure. their their let's let's call it agrarian roots at a, at a time. And you can even just go across country lines. There there are words that are spoken in Ireland and 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 Scotland that are not sure. swear but, words that but are in England, but the considered usage, incredibly dirty. Right. But the the problem though is that the usage and the context and all of that matters. Oh, it does. So, and also, well, it's, some, it's a phenomenological right. thing. But somebody else could hear what you're saying, even if you don't mean it in, in a certain way, think that you do, they get offended, they go they go essentially tattle on you, yeah. and now you might be suspended from a game that you are playing to yeah. make a living. And that's the part that, that concerns me. Mm-hmm. And also, you might be even suspended, not even from Overwatch League, because this, this can extend to players, by the way. You might just be a player, and now you might not be able to play a game that you pay for, or that you've purchased content in, or that you've poured a lot of yeah. hours in, for something that you actually 
didn't even intend because someone else decided that they were going to have hurt feelings. Well, and that, that's where I agree with you, where I think that there's... That's my concern. Th- I think this is definitely a much more complicated issue than people tend to make it, mm-hmm. and people tend to draw very hard lines. And I think that the state of discourse is really in a bad place right now, just in general, yeah, no political kidding. and related to this. I agree completely. Say. Well, um, if, if we're meant to take video game leaks seriously then we need to have a cultural standard by which we can appropriately judge, whether that be a tribunal or something like that. But, but for the maker of the game uh, to be able to say that that's like, it would be like the inventor of football who's quite dead going to the NFL and saying, okay, you're off the team. Right. That doesn't make any sense at all. No, it doesn't. That makes no sense at all. And And, so, and it needs to be someone that is, that is on, that understands um, the culture and understands gamer culture and understands internet culture mm-hmm. and memes and the sort of things that you say. I mean, there's, there was even someone that got in trouble for typing in uh, GGEZ, which essentially just means good game easy mm-hmm. or sometimes get good easy. Mm-hmm. The idea being that, oh, well, they were saying that as a sarcastic remark. Yeah. Like, so what? Like you were so easy to beat. So yes, but it's... so what? <laughs> there's nothing hateful about that. You're just you're you you are essentially being boastful. It's trash and you're talk, taunting man. them. It's trash talking. But guess what? You ever watch any sports? That's all they ever do. That's yeah. all sp- yeah. people do in sports is trash talk. Mm-hmm. And we're even that, watch that's, some hockey. Right. Watch any sport. Watch football. Yeah. You know, watch yeah. basketball. They, they trash talk all the time. It's a part of the game. If you're going to play a game, especially if you're going to play a game at a professional level, you have to expect trash talk. That's right. And when you start putting limits on that and you start trying to say, Oh, this this amount of trash talk is okay, and this amount this amount is too toxic. Or even if you call all of it toxic, well, you're you are unfortunately limiting the game, and you're limiting its its appeal to uh, to a general audience. Which we, by the way, have seen. I do have the numbers to show. Overwatch League viewership has been dropping for reasons that might not be directly related to this, but <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> maybe maybe not. We don't know. Yeah. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. All right, so here's one I haven't talked about in a while. Pokemon Go. It actually has a big AR update. The augmented reality feature has uh, gone sort of into a new level. Now, it's only available for uh, iOS 11 compatible uh, devices, but uh, it lets you get way closer to sort of wild Pokemon. They act more like you would expect them to instead of just being overlays on the world. You actually have to sneak up on them in order to capture them. It's a little bit more, um, let's say, uh, like you would think Pokemon should be. Now, the question has arisen, is that in fact the way we want Pokemon to be? If you know what I mean. Uh, But it's a little more challenging, a little more uh, realistic, if you will. The Pokemans themselves are, uh, I guess you could say, authentically scaled. Some of the the rather large dragon-like ones, um, they're huge. They're just huge. And, you know, the, the, the little Rattatas and whatnot, Pidgeys and so on. They're, they're tiny instead of getting that weird forced perspective kind of a thing. Uh, anyway, download it again if you haven't in a while and you were a fan at one point. I think it's worth checking out, assuming your device is compatible. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, taking a few days and uh, having some walks and get back into the exercise because that's how I get my exercise uh, with this new uh, fun update. And now... This week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, so Doc, when we were doing our uh, pre-show prep, I yeah. remember uh, you were the one who kind of threw out this idea of like the new lane party, or it was kind of like you and Jim combined. But and I was talking about you know setting up this uh, these Overwatch scrimmages yeah. and how it, it sounded to you guys a lot like a lane party. Yeah, it took but, us like five minutes mm-hmm. to figure out it wasn't a lane party. Mm-hmm. Actually, yeah, I thought it was. We, yeah. we thought you were in the <laughs> same room with all these people, and you're like, no, nobody's in the same room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's called it, the internet. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, like the difference was that basically we just all got online and got in the same lobby. And did private scrimmages, yeah. but it wasn't, you know, like an in-person virtual land like, party. Yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting and ironic because uh, one of the first things that I noted whenever you showed me this um, 
league play was that all these guys were in the same room. Yeah. They yeah. actually do play over LAN, which is important because it uh that means there's a zero ping. Yeah. Right. Um so they're it's they're playing in an optimal way. There's oh. no there's no lag between an input and the yeah, result. That, that makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Um so but I, I thought that was kind of funny and ironic considering that the whole point of the game is that you can play from sort of a, a, a distance Mm-hmm. So, uh, but that makes perfect sense that you'd want to do that, uh, from, from a technical perspective. Uh, now that said, um, what, what you've been doing, it, it really kind of sounds like, at least from a cultural perspective, what we used to do back in the day, whenever we would run cables down the hallway mm-hmm. in the dorm room and get a bunch mm-hmm. of people on a doom server, right? Like well, uh, doom even, two. Yeah. And then a few people, uh, like, like I had a, I had a college girlfriend that I would play with. Mm-hmm. Right. And we would dial in mm. uh, and just stuff like that. It's a lot of us, like it, you would play, um, you know, a lot of shooters like Doom, Doom 2, um, Quake. Uh-huh. Uh, early, early on, you could even play Counter-Strike, as yeah. I recall. Yeah. Um, and then obviously other games like Age of Empires was a big one. I know yeah. for Age of Empires well, 2 was more my All the RTSs, my, my man. Experience. Yeah. All, all the Warcrafts. I think uh, QuakeCon actually still has the thing where they have a big old room and people bring Quake, their yeah. Quake Arena. And, yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. And um, Worms Armageddon was yeah. another one that I remember playing. Well, and I got a friend who plays Quake 3 every single night still. Yeah. Um, he gets totally trashed because he's playing against the teenagers. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it it's a thing. So I'm wondering what the difference is or the benefit is, and, and I've got some theories here, with knowing the people, at least by one degree of separation, mm. um, who you are playing against. Mm-hmm. And yet the old sort of draw of it everybody being down the hallway is you could hear him screaming yes uh, and that was you know and no no when you rail, win, rail gun I goes a, i have a great story about uh-huh. that too right so we were playing age of empires 2 uh-huh. um in college and so it was my friend and i were on one team and then right across the hall like right you open the door there the, the door right on the other side are a couple of our friends who were were also roommates and they were playing on the same team as well. Yeah, sure. So as we're as we're 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 playing the game, um, uh, the friend in the other room, the friend in the other room, he had built up a whole bunch of archers. You know, he's playing he had a longbowman rather sure, for yeah. England, yeah, which yeah. are kind of broken in terms of the distance. So you could create towers, and your towers wouldn't be able to actually defend from the longbowman. They could stand far enough back that they could actually shoot over your walls and the tower, depending uh-huh. on how you had them, and still take out your buildings, which yeah. is what he was doing. So we had a whole bunch of them, and you couldn't actually send, this was at my friend's base, you couldn't actually send anyone out to get him uh, to go after them because there were so many longbowmen, they would shoot them down before the ca- anyone could come through. It was yeah, like sure. just a narrow area. So what I did was, I I had been sort of like seemingly decimated but i wasn't Mm -hmm. i was actually amassing an army of paladins off to the side off to the side dirty dog so so many of them in fact that they filled up the screen and i couldn't select them all with one drag i had to make like two and a half drags (laughs) too full and so i just then when i was ready i actually did this on purpose i just told my friend i kept because he kept telling me just send them in now send them in now i'm like no I, i want it to be absurd when i send them in so then i send them all in at the same time and i have them run through and as they're obliterating his base from the back, I have them come through and, of course, kill the longbowman. But I waited till the end to kill the longbowman because I because I knew that he was focused so much on taking down my friend's base because he thought that I was too weak to do anything at uh-huh. the time that he wouldn't know that his base was being destroyed until it was too late, which is what happened. And uh, the second that I that I saw like you know his king and I killed his king, I I run out of the room. Bolt across the door. Of course, our doors were unlocked. Sl- fly open. I run in and I'm like. You're dead. You're dead. And I'm like screaming at him. And, uh-huh. he, and, and, you know, the second I burst in, I see him like hastily trying to alt tab out of the game. Uh-huh. And so, and so he had some like other uh, browser window up. He's like, I wasn't even paying attention. I'd stop playing, like trying to play it off. Like he didn't know. <laughs> oh, we gave him so much crap for that for so long. That's hilarious. Yeah. But that's the fun. That's part of the fun of LAN. It's like you you know who you're playing yeah. with. They're your friends. Hey, there's trash talk coming back up yeah, again, no right? No kidding, right? You're trash talking, but you know, they're your friends. They know you're just playing around with them. And uh, you have that, you know, experience, that camaraderie, whether you're playing with them or against them. Yeah. And that's that's part of the LAN party. So here it's like you're you're not necessarily, you're not there physically. So you couldn't just uh, hop a plane, fly over to Europe and go talk to one of these guys you're playing with, mm-hmm. right? Right. But- you do know them. You can still talk to them. You can chat yeah. with them. You're using a, um, what, a Discord? Yeah, Discord. Server. Yeah, yeah. So you can still chat with them, talk to them, and, and you do a little trash talk. Yeah, and in, in this particular case, um, 
And like, I'm not one to do trash talk. That's just not my personality. Oh, I was going to ask you for what, <laughs> give me some of your, give me some of your best trash. I, talk. I have none. Um, <laughs> you just heard it right there. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but like, I, I know personally, I think like maybe, yeah, three of the guys, um, we actually like know each other. We've like hung out in person. Now we're kind of like spread out across either like Texas or the country in some cases. Um, but then like they sort of like they know people that they've met online or something like that. And so I've played with a couple of the other people before, but I would say probably at least half of the people that we were playing with, I had actually never encountered before. They were all, um, I, I feel like they were all better connected and I was kind of like an outsider coming in in a way. But at the same time, these were all like, you know, kind of, you know, cool folks. And one of the things that's really nice about being able to communicate and actually coordinate with people like this is that, um, you can have like actual discussions about like, um, what we're doing is not working and it's kind of in like a, even if it's not like, you know, like this really formal, respectful way, like per se, like it wasn't like any different really than what you might find online, but what you had is a degree of like, not politeness in like the etiquette sense, but politeness in a, like not getting down on someone uh, or coming down on someone for doing something that you didn't like. Um, just learn be- your class, man. Learn <laughs> your class. Oh, that stuff. You mean like the, um. Almost, it's almost like trash talk for your own team, which mm-hmm. I always seem always seems really odd to yeah. do because like, you're not you're certainly not helping mm-hmm. the situation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And like, what tends to happen is when you get online with just random people, and there are like a lot of reasons for this. I know, and some people are just like you know they're having a bad day, or they've been like playing twelve matches and haven't won any, and so they're just like really angry at people. Right. But um, like, there's this thing that we we call it currently getting tilted. Where basically everyone just like gets really angry at each other and just becomes like the shouting match or people just like shut down and stop talking and all this different stuff. Um, and that's something that happens very frequently online. It's one of the reasons that I tend to avoid um, communicating, um, which is probably part of the reason I'm not super high on the ladder um, because it does require a lot of coordination to be really good. But I found at least in my level, it probably gets better as you get higher um, on the ladder. But in my level, the communication doesn't really help that much. And really, there's just a bigger potential for people to get tilted and for things to get ugly and for it to not be any fun. And so I just tend to kind of like hop in. I play by role. I know what I'm doing. Um, try to coordinate as much as you can by kind of like the nonverbal means um, and then just kind of deal with it. If you got a team that's not coordinated. Chris, are you a tryhard? Uh, not usually. No. OK, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. But right. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's kind of your your reasoning why you wanted to get in with these people and play. Um not not necessarily a LAN in the traditional sense, but the sim- a similar concept. A private lobby. Yeah, yeah a private lobby. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. So is this something that um, y'all are seeing more and more in terms of other games, other game spaces, for aside from just, say, Overwatch? I could see how it, it could happen in other sort of similar team-based games. Mm-hmm. Um, I know uh, PUBG, um, Play- PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. Um, is pretty popular among people who actually like will group up, group up intentionally. Which is coming and, to PS4 soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, there's the mobile version too, which I'm not sure how that. I works. have no idea how that would work, <laughs> but um, apparently, it's there. Um, but yeah, like people will sort of uh, team up and they'll they'll do that. Um, so like yeah, kind of like a lot of these sort of like team based multiplayer games, even if it's not necessarily shooters. Although that's what tends to come to mind. Things like CS:GO. Mm. Um, actually, incidentally, things that would be traditionally things that you would play at a LAN party or at a at a LAN. Um, place like you, you remember those places that, like you used to go to and pay oh, yes. hourly to oh yes I, I i know them well yeah <laughs> i've been i've been to some i, I, w- I went to a couple it was usually like a, yeah. a friend's birthday party or something like that because none of us we were all you know, like you know like middle schoolers at the mm-hmm. time we couldn't afford to do that on a regular basis oh not all of us <laughs> i remember the uh the experience of of you know taking your computer over to a to a friend's house and you all are going there and making sure that you have your computer set up mm-hmm. So that you could all play together. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, I hosted a lock-in back in the early mm-hmm. 2000s for a bunch of middle schoolers. And it was uh, bring your Xbox and the special cord. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, they they brought TVs and they brought Xbox. They had like 30 of them mm-hmm. all just hooked up together at whatever whatever the max was. They had it like twice. And it was just crazy to walk around that room and try not to trip over the cords. <laughs> uh, and I'm thinking, oh man, this is so modern. I remember in the old days, whenever you had to hook it up and you didn't know what a SCSI port was. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting now it's like, everything's just wired in, uh, wirelessly, so to speak. All the devices play nice now. Mm-hmm. So now I'm curious, are whenever, on your playthrough, is everybody on PC? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there there are console versions of Overwatch, but they don't interplay. Um, they don't interplay with PC? Right, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, reason being because um, it's a competitive game, inherently, yeah. and uh, the console players would be at a pretty big disadvantage. Right. Yeah, they Ma- would. Mouse and keyboard is superior in all ways. Yeah. Well, I know things like Battlefront have allowed the players to coexist. Yeah. And so they've actually nerfed. Um, yeah, they yeah I've they nerfed the PC version. I think we talked about yeah we did. It may not have been Battlefront in particular, but we definitely talked about how Call of Duty and stuff may have been that, yeah, yeah how how they essentially nerfed the mouse and keyboard um aiming so that you can't actually aim with the same level of precision that you right. normally can right. But that that does make sense. I think it makes a lot more sense to just lock them out and like separate them into two different spaces, mm-hmm. um yep. as opposed to nerfing mouse and keyboard which is just yeah silly. trying to somehow make it equitable is yeah i silly. think i think there are some games that actually could pretty reasonably have like a pc console crossover i think there are some mmos that do that yeah and it makes a lot of sense because oh, cer- oh certainly i'm not saying yeah spot. i'm certainly not saying but no yeah, game for, should i mean mm-hmm. yes i'm talking about like i'm really talking about fbs yeah it's really sure. the big one yeah yeah um or rts i guess actually you wouldn't want to play an rts on a well, console versus a PC. I don't think oh, you want geez. to play an RTS on a console anyway. Well, some of, yeah, some of them are made for you, you can, you can. Like there, Halo, Halo Wars, terrible. Halo Wars, for yeah. example, mm. was relatively successful at doing an That's RTS. That's true. That's a good example on a on a console. Mm-hmm. But in terms of you know, with the keyboard, you have all those key bindings that you can set up that you're just not going to have enough yep. keys on a, on a controller to keep up with. Of yeah. course, it's completely possible to bring a keyboard in and a Bluetooth sure is. Bluetooth keyboard yep, and, sure and, and hook it up to your console. Most people don't do it, but yeah. it's possible. That's mm-hmm. a good point. So I, I'm kind of curious then how would we define a LAN game and then how, what, what, which of those elements would, would sort of still carry over to today? And then what, what can the games of today do that would be outside of LAN? You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, well, uh, where I'm headed towards with, with this sort of open set of questions is should we be calling it LAN or should we be calling it something else? I mean, it's definitely not local. Right. It's uh, it's remote. I, mm-hmm. I would say the first part to make sure that ran that we, it's a ran party. It's a ran um, to 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 differentiate it from other multiplayer games. The first thing that we we have to I think eliminate is everyone has to be have their own screen, right? Because otherwise, you know, you could have local multiplayer. Sure, and, and, and split, screen. split screen. Sure, yeah, but that's a whole different. But thing. Everyone needs their own screen. That's couch co op, right? That's so, a different thing, or or even couch versus. But it's, but if you have the well, same yeah, screen, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So you need to have. Everyone, everyone must have their own separate screen. Every player, it can't just be some, not even like Smash Bros, where some people have the Switch screen and some people have the screen, but they're still sharing screens. Yeah, yeah. Be, everyone has their individual screen and they're separated enough that you're not looking at other people's screens to see what they're doing, mm-hmm. right? Because so, that was the mm-hmm. big thing too. Sometimes in the uh, you know land places, you would even try to position yourself so that you're not next to someone that might be against you. So mm-hmm. you don't, you can't, they can't look over no, no and see what you're doing. Yeah. Right. So that I think is part of it too, is you have to have the ability to do that, to even consider calling it land. The other thing is um, to differentiate it from the other sort of complete opposite direction are things like MMOs where you're playing with, you know, hundreds of people potentially in one area, but th- you don't know the vast majority of them. Maybe you know a few of them. Maybe you're friends with a few of them, and you're communicating on um, on a, you know a channel, maybe even a Discord or something. Um, and you you're all talking to one another, possibly via voice. Um, but most of them you don't know. Most of them are strangers. They're just people that happen to be in the game. They're the game space isn't for your team. It's for anyone, and you just happen to have a few people that you know in that, yeah. that space. Yeah, and you can build a community out of people that you like, say, guild up with or something sure. like that. But um, ultimately, like. And I was thinking, you know, MMOs are a little bit fuzzy in that regard, but I agree with you. Like, I wouldn't classify MMOs as this sort just because it is a very different sort of game. Yeah, that's a really um, good point. But then I think, like, there's also something to be said for um, not having random matchmaking. Now, so something that we actually took advantage of is in our lobby, we had a... Um, we we initially tried having manual balance, mm-hmm. uh, but then we sort of let the game start to figure out how we're performing, and they would actually pair us up based on um, kind of how we're doing. Uh, and so, um, we were able to, uh, you know, the, the game sort of curated that sort of the balancing of the player skill levels, uh, during that session for us, but it's still like, we knew what the, who the pool was. It wasn't a mm-hmm. pool of everyone who's queuing up right now in the sure, world. Yeah. It's the queue of just us 12 and we were all going to be in every match. Um, and so I think that kind of having, having kind of that lobby mentality of I am joining this game. Um, as opposed to just joining any game is something that's probably a part of this definition. Definitely, yeah. 
that makes a lot of sense. Do you think, do you think the, like knowing them IRL is important or having, having contacts with them? Let's even, let's broaden it out to even just social media. Like, um, oh yeah, this is a guy I know from Facebook, mm-hmm. right? We didn't go to school together, but mm-hmm. Is, well, I think is that important? Or you is liked it? my post once. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, I think I think more and more we have, um, and I know that uh, Will Parsons on a previous show talked about this to some to, at some length. Uh, the idea of having friends now that don't have to be people you actually have met, mm-hmm. um, but are maybe like closer friends um, through correspondence than right. you might have with some people you actually, or, or know that in you person. haven't met in person, right. but you've met them, yeah. you've talked with them. It's a little different right. for me. I, I tend to not know anybody digitally that I didn't meet first in person, mm-hmm. but there are definitely some people who my relationship with has improved since they moved very far away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, that I have these occasional conversations with them, which are really great. And, and it's like, um, you know, a little bit of you know, very, very spicy or seasoned, uh, you know, something added to the soup. And I, it's not like I have to make time for them. Uh, in long periods of time, I can literally just get on with a time shifted conversation and be like, Oh, Hey dude, how's it going? And I don't know. It, it seems to me like that would be the kind of relationship that would make itself um, fun to play with in an online space mm-hmm. in that way. Um, if this is your hobby, you know, in the sense that, uh, well, what do you, you know, what do you do for fun? This is my leisure activity. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, well, I, I really like online league play and I'm, a member of a league Mm. and that changes the dynamic. I think it, it sort of almost makes it a little more serious than just, uh, Hey, you guys want to get together on Saturday and and play some games? Okay. It's like, uh, the difference between getting together, you know, every Saturday to just kind of play bowling with who's ever there. Just bowl with play bowling to bowl with who's ever there versus joining a bowling league. Even right. if you're not professional, yeah, you go, yeah. you're joining a league, you have like specific times you're going to play. You might have tournaments, but you're going to know the other people that you're playing against because it's like a, you know, a local mm. league kind of thing. And this is as opposed to going to the bowling alley and say, um, put me in a game that's starting in the next 15 minutes. Right. And, and even they if, pair you up with three sure. other people. And even if you're going with friends to play, you're not going to know everybody there. Mm. There's some people you're not going to know. You're going to be, there's going to be a mix of a bunch of different people. And it's also not going to be taken as seriously either. Yeah. You is might that, end up with nine Nihilists. Nihilists, Donnie. <laughs> Nihilists. That's a big Lebowski. Yeah, no, no, I, I, no. I, I, got I got it. We all got it. Yeah, okay. Just, you know, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know if the internet got it. Did you guys get it? Okay. Um, but do you think that's a part of it as well, this um, taking it a little bit more seriously when you play as opposed to um, if you weren't in the space? Oh, that's a great would question. You, would you might be going in there thinking to yourself, okay, this time I don't really know how to play this character as well, or I don't know how to use this one particular strategy. So this time I'm going to try this out and experiment Mm -hmm. or or do this, or maybe I'm just going to play for fun, not really take, not really pay that much attention because I just wanted to kill some time. Mm -hmm. But then when you're together with these people, you have a different sort of mentality that you go about it. And that's interesting because I think that depending on why you're getting together with these people to do this, it may be more or less competitive depending on the group. Um, I think in our particular case, we were... We wanted to have a legitimate competitive experience um, among ourselves. But mm-hmm. at the same time, you also had people who were like a lot more forgiving of, say, mistakes, for example. Like someone's like, oh, sorry, I messed that up. And they're like, no, no don't worry about it because it's like it's a friendly match. Know your character. Um, yeah, right. Know your or, class. or even some people actually said um, like pretty much like verbatim, um, well, if there's any time to experiment, it's now. So if you want to play this character that you don't know very well, mm-hmm. uh, but they, they might work well in this composition then jump on and we'll see how it goes. Um, so I think that in our particular case, we we were open to the idea of um, experimenting and just trying new things out. And it wasn't like a super hardcore competitive thing. But that being said, like you sort of translate that into um, like, say like uh, actually you mentioned like I'm part of a league, you know, there is like actually an official way that you can go from being just like any random overwatch player to being a overwatch league pro player. And basically they'll have like um, sort of invite, well, not invitational, but like open tournaments on the server mm-hmm. um, where you can kind of participate and get like sort of like, you know, the top power kind of mini, rank up. And, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then they've got um, eventually what's called the Contenders League, which is kind of if you want to think of it, it's like minor league Overwatch. Um, it's like a whole bunch of teams in different regions. Like there's one for Europe and one for North America and all this different stuff um, where they actually like have teams of six people, maybe a little bit more that they can sub in and out are actually like trying to either um, get scouted by or become themselves potentially um, Overwatch League teams. Uh, so all the teams that are in Overwatch League currently were actually um, contenders teams um, before 
they actually started Overwatch League proper. Hmm. Um, but that being said, like I kind of like the idea of almost having like uh, you know go down to the community rec center and you join your city's like kind of municipal adults you know sports league or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's kind of an interesting idea that people might do that for like an Overwatch or something like that. And they probably do exist. Like you go to some website and they probably have like a, um, you could probably sign up to participate and like they expect you to be on at this time and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if that's very prevalent right now and might be like more prevalent in say some other game other than Overwatch that I'm just not aware of. Um, that, that's kind of an interesting idea though, that you might actually kind of recreationally join some amateur league. Fascinating. Well, and it really blurs the line, I think, between I got this game for Christmas and I'm going to hop onto the server and play some random games Mm -hmm. all the way up to that level of what is, I mean, it's not essentially, it is uh, a professional league Mm -hmm. um, with with sports stars. I mean, it's weird to think about, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's sort of everything on the spectrum in between. So... But kind of going back to our original question of like, you know, do, do we call these LAN games or something like that? I think that the word LAN, um, of course, local area network, yeah. means something very specific. It, it has a specific meaning, yeah. sure. I think these might be, you might be able to call them maybe like a, like a private lobby or mm-hmm. just a lobby mm-hmm. lobby game or lobby experience, mm-hmm. which LAN games also fall into. So it's more like they both fall in, under the same um, umbrella term as a LAN game, mm-hmm. right? Or as a LAN experience. They're, they're different multiplayer modes, sure, basically. But they're both... They're both under that one umbrella. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like subsets. Right. Which I think is fair. I do think, um, because we did talk about it before, kind of the, some of the experiences that people can have and dislike um, with, with people, with strangers, you know, like you, because everyone has a different level of what they can and can't accept in terms of behavior. We talked a little bit about toxic behaviors earlier, what may or may not be. So when you are playing in a private lobby or you are playing with people that you know personally, you're going to know um what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and i'm going to know when i'm playing with my friends that we could be as completely obscene to one another and we all know that it's part of the fun it's different when you buy the pizza yeah right but but that being said that's a good that's a good phrase too different when you buy the pizza right Um, or quoting myself from the the last time we did that or 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 share the pizza right right yeah with one another so as opposed to i know that you know when i'm when i'm actually playing online games which I, i don't do as much anymore um i'm always very respectful to people, to be honest, despite what it may have seemed like I was arguing before. Um, I actually don't act like that personally. I, I don't um, around strangers because I don't know how they're going to react. Yeah. And I, I have no interest in just randomly insulting someone. I doesn't really, mm-hmm. I, I don't really want to do that. Right? I have no interest in doing it. So I don't know what they're going to accept and what they're not going to accept. So unless I know them, I'm not going to intentionally try to push their buttons. So I do think that it's nice to have that experience where you can be in a private lobby with people that you know, mm-hmm. and you all understand, you know, this is how we're going to compose ourselves because it's that kind of like unspoken code. You know each other very well. You mm-hmm. know what you know what's going to set them off. You know what's not going to set them off. You might go up up to that line and all, and kind of like brush against it, but you're not going to necessarily cross it depend, unless you know them really well. And then you will as a joke and laugh about it later. But yeah, um, you, but yeah, it kind of it gives it it. I mentioned it being a little bit more serious, but in a way, it's more relaxing too mm-hmm. because you you can just be yourself and not worry about what other people might think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're kind of like a, they're a known quantity, the people that you're dealing with. And even if you have an issue that comes up with something like say, like, you know, most people are pretty much okay with this and there's one person that takes issue with right, it. Right. But then like that person, like there was even an example in the same group that we were playing with where previously, um, one of the guys didn't like how another person was speaking just generally mm-hmm. when they were around. And so, um, they had like a one-on-one conversation where he's like, Hey, I, I don't really appreciate like when you talk like this or about these things, uh, when I'm around. So if you could not do that when we're playing together, that'd be appreciated. And basically he stopped doing that to the same extent when he's with that other person. That's called friendship. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's called, it's called personal relations. Yeah. <laughs> it's called having a relationship with somebody. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we get so distilled, I think by social media and texting and all of that kind of thing. We, we almost forget how to look somebody in the eye and, and, and be like, stop being an idiot. I mean, I support your right to be an idiot because it makes me look really good, <laughs> but, you know, just stop. Well, or just or just having a conversation with someone and recognizing that they might be acting a certain way or speaking a certain way because they don't they don't see it as being in any of way course. insulting, whereas they don't understand that you're being insulted by it. So instead yeah, of just assuming right. that they're trying to insult you, you go, well, wait a minute, maybe this person isn't trying to insult me. They're just, it's just how they act. Yeah. If I talk to them and say, hey, that actually... 
That's actually it kind of hurt my feelings. You mind cutting that out? They, yeah. Then then they're going to go, oh, whoa, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. You can actually have a conversation with people and not just jump to conclusions and think they're horrible people right Instead off the of bat. expecting somebody else to, to, read to, your to mind, govern themselves and, and in to case also, they might offend you. Sure. And to read your mind, too, and know what right. will and won't offend you. Empathy, big problem in America. Yeah. Western world. Mm-hmm. Empathy, a problem with people. <laughs> yeah. People are people are dumb. I don't like we, people. We, <laughs> could, <laughs> we probably already had a similar topic to it, but uh, it's, it's maybe... Slightly outside of our scope, but this concept is something that I believe the concept of um, as we go more and more towards digital devices and, and communicating with people on um, social network networks without actually knowing them face to face and seeing who they are. Yeah. We lose that ability to determine, um, you know, when they are and when they aren't serious and when they when they are when they are trying to be, you know, in, insulting or when they're just trying they're just reacting a certain way. Um and just being real with you and you lose that ability to kind of say um, to them or, and think of them as another person that like you may just not understand you. Mm-hmm. And so you, 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 you stop trying to understand one another on both sides. It's not, I'm not saying it's one sided on both sides. you stop trying to understand one another. And instead you talk past each other and just essentially try to, you know, try to win because you don't care about trying to understand one another. Yeah. You, you just want to, um, you want to get your thoughts out there, and all that matters is I'm going to, I'm going to share my opinion. I don't care what you say. I don't care to talk about this and try to understand you, and then find a way to meet in the middle. Instead, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and you're going to say what you're going to say. But I'm going to try to prove you wrong so that what I say is right. It's a very narcissistic way of of thinking, but I feel like that's one of the problems that we're having. I feel uh-huh. eventually maybe humanity will figure it out, but because all this technology is so new, and because we've been communicating one way for you know, so many thousands of years. And now in only the past few decades, we've been communicating in this other way. Yeah, yeah. We haven't figured out Just how to do that generation, yet. Yeah. Right. We haven't figured out how to do that yet. And it's going to cause more, a lot more problems before it gets better. I think you're right. Yeah. We're going to have to design um, back towards that. Well, one solution to that might then be in this kind of a game, let's say, for example, an emote, right? Uh, a positive emote um, that you give to another player, then, um, is tracked. And so once you've started having positive emotes with another player, then let's say um, the likelihood that you'll be in a game with them again is increased. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so um, with those mo- when those modifiers start building, then maybe you can start building a, like a micro community. Um, that's a sort of an, an emergent, Oh, he logged on. Let's, let's plug him back into his micro community um, so that you could then begin having real conversations with people knowing, and this is where it comes, it, it comes in. The important part comes in dynamically knowing in the back of your mind, if I say something truly rude, racist, or deeply offensive to, uh, this guy, uh, I'm going to have to deal with that later. Well, that, they may not want to play be, with you again. Right. There, there, there might be, that. there might be some real social repercussions to that. You know what that reminds me of a lot, hmm. actually, um, did you ever play Final Fantasy XI, either of you? Uh, no, but I had some friends who did. So in fi- it's a, it was an MMO. Mm-hmm. And so in Final Fantasy XI, they didn't actually have, uh, this, at least initially, I think they added them later, they didn't have the same sort of like broader chat or guild chats that World of, World of Warcraft had or other, other MMOs like EverQuest. Instead, they had these uh, beads, essentially, that you would hand out to someone. And if someone had a bead, uh, it was like you were inviting them to, to be a part of your channel. Oh. And that was how you played with someone. It's very similar to kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. If you like someone, you're like, you, you, you find someone in the, in the world and you need to help on a quest. And you're like, hey, let's, let's go on this quest together. Okay. And there was, of course, party chat. So you chat in a party once you're, once you're partied right. up. And then towards the end, you're like, hey, we had a great time. Here, let's trade beads. And we can, we, so now we can talk to one another um, on this special channel for anyone that has this sort of bead. And you could have multiples. And this was how they, yeah. Final Fantasy XI got around not having guilds initially before they had guild chat was because they would just share beads. So it's kind of similar to what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's very similar to yeah. what I'm talking about, is, is that let's have the technology actually lead us back towards what our brains are very, very good at doing, which is making good social decisions. The problem, I think, ultimately is going to come down to this. We are hardwired into our bodies with, with our perception and with our emotions and what we look at and what we understand. And f- like, for example, facial, uh, just body language. That yes. means yes. something. And so we're going to need the technology to be able to, to project that mm-hmm. better so I that agree. we can then read it better. Um, I, I mean, w- without it necessarily showing 
who you are if you want to remain anonymous. Right. That's the big difference is that some people use um, – for for various reasons, they want to remain anonymous online, and it's not necessarily because, oh, they're just evil and they want to insult people. No, mm-hmm. they might actually have things about themselves that they don't want other people in their life to know sure, about. Yeah. So they want so they choose to be anonymous online, right? Well, the problem so, – so I agree it's with you. It's wish fulfillment too. You can be anything you want And online. that too. So th- we have to kind of, kind of find a way to balance that. We're, we still allow them to do that but still have the facial recognition and body language, yeah. it, which kind of comes back to – what was that show from Battlestar Galactica but the prequel – we talked about it a little bit. Um, I forget what it was called, but essentially everybody steps into this virtual reality world uh-huh. and they can look like whatever they want to look like, but they still have those social interactions Yeah, yeah. Um, with facial expressions and body language and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they look like however they feel like they want to look like. Ready Player One uh, deals with this issue. Yeah. The the book almost kind of glosses over it in, in how the technology manages it, but it seems very, very obvious that it does. I'm curious how the movie's going to handle that because, um, and, and it may just be the same thing is that once you're in there, it's like interacting with a real person and yeah. they have facial expressions. Have you seen sort of the, the newest trailer, the theatrical trailer? No, I haven't. Um, that one might answer some questions for you. They oh, okay. actually will show like the same person, like outside the game and then inside mm-hmm. the game and how their avatar looks a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one person who looks kind of like this sort of like vaguely alien, uh, character. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you, you actually see a shot of her outside the game too, or at least I, I knew who that person was supposed to be because I've read the book. I don't right. know if the yeah, audience yeah. would get it, but you can very clearly see that like once you're in there, like they even say in the trailer, like, Oh, you can be anyone or you can be anything. Right. And they sort of like show that transition from outside to inside. Okay, cool. Um, and then, yeah, like I think there's implicitly like they put a thing around their neck that reads their face mm-hmm. um, so that it sort of maps their expressions and the way they're talking to what they're doing. In Love the it. Game. Yeah. Love it. And, and that's kind of what I'm talking yeah. about, but that may be so on the nose that it's not what I'm actually talking no, about. I I think I think it is because I know if if anyone's ever experienced and you see this on on various internet forums as well. Uh, anytime an internet forum lets you choose an avatar or a picture uh-huh. that represents who you who what, who you are, sure, yeah, right. But it's usually it's themed after whatever the channel is, right? So let's yeah. say like it's a channel about say um, I remember back in the day I used to post on Adult Swim channel many many years ago, like mm-hmm. a couple of decades ago, and my avatar was Lupin from Lupin the Third, which right. is if you've ever seen that show, he's a um, you know, sarcastic, womanizing, rascal, rapscallion, yeah, yeah. you know, thief. Sounds just like you. Well, <laughs> maybe, but my, but my point is that him and his facial expressions, they conjure up a particular image. Yeah. So a lot of the times, anything that I would, I would post or I would, I would, you know, type, a lot of people would, cons- would think that I was being sarcastic or kidding or, you know, you see the picture and you automatically read that text in however you perceive that picture, which sure. by the way is what happens to, to go do a little callback what we talked about before, you know, with with meme, memes when you don't understand them, like the picture, the tryhard image that was that was posted, trihex, you see that, and the and the way that the image appears, it conjures up certain imagery based on if you have if you have no context for it, right? Yeah. It conjures up certain imagery as well, just based on that expression. Just like if you take a picture of yourself smiling and looking happy, and that's your avatar that people are going to see, say on Facebook, versus. Your avatar is you being really depressed and looking all disheveled. It gives a very different perception of who you are, and it's going to color your posts and That's what right. they say a certain way yeah. because we don't have anything else to go by. We don't have your facial expression. Mm-hmm. We don't have your body language. So we're trying to substitute anything that we can, even if it's a picture of a cartoon character. Yeah. And I think this kind of leads me into indirectly something that I'd like to kind of start wrapping um, this discussion on, and that is how we got from – a world in which land parties were kind of a go-to means of doing this sort of thing to kind of having those disappear and going to more of a sort of anonymized uh, hop online with whomever you can mentality. And then what it might take to get us from that back to a more of a land lobby mentality. I got two answers for you. Mm. First, we graduated from college. Second, and we got real jobs, right? <laughs> um, and, and second, phones became computers. That's what I would say. Because the, the first one, that was just... You know, there's still people that are in high school and college, yeah, right? Grew, and they're not, and they're not doing it though. No, but, but they but didn't. They're, they're not. That's true. That's my. So I think your, but I think your second response is spot on. I agree with that. It's the, it's the phones. It's yes, that we I have. Agree. We have now. We're all cyborgs, mm-hmm. but we're cyborgs who don't look up. We look down. Yeah, and so we need we need to figure out how we can be cyborgs who look up. And once we're once we're cyborgs who look up again, I think it'll be. A way better. I'm reminded of the Futurama episode where the iPhone uh, comes out, and so he goes into the store and they jam it into his eye, uh, and then he has AR. 
Yeah. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of the sort of thing I'm thinking of. Maybe something like Back to the Future 3, where they're wearing the glasses was the prediction. Um, you know, they didn't have phones. They had, they all they were wearing the glasses with the AR stuff. I don't think that's the right answer, but I think there is a right answer. If I could come up with the right answer, then, you know, I could easily be the next, uh, you know, multi-billionaire because I could sell my idea or whatever. But um, there's actually been a lot of talk lately. I'm glad you mentioned it mm -hmm. about um, AR glasses. In fact, the Epic's, the Epic Games CEO specifically said, are in talking about AR glasses, of course, because they're developing some, mm -hmm. but um, he says that they will eventually replace smartphones. And there's been talk about that yeah. from other other um, people within the tech industry that are pushing it, Google as well, when they developed Google Glass. I think they were a little too early with it. Oh, they were way too early with um, that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez, that was, what, like five years ago? Mm -hmm. so they were way early. Um, but there is this idea, and we see it a lot of times in science fiction shows, um, where it's essentially a similar concept as a smartphone in terms of the information that you're able to get, in terms of the data you're able to get at your, quote, fingertips. Yeah. But instead, it's it within your vision and you're able to yeah. see it as you go. So you don't have to see it another way. It's always there. And it's also um, a part of the world that you're, that you're yeah. inhabiting too. It's not just, you know, it's, it's part of, as I'm just, as I'm talking to you, it's not a separate space that I'm looking at. Well, we're going to need better filters um, right now. You know, I, I don't even look at my Facebook wall anymore because yeah. it's so badly filtered. I, I don't want to waste the 15 to 20 minutes uh, looking at the trash and the ads to see something that might potentially be meaningful. And so I would look at it this way, you know, for, for millions of years, humans have been working up to this thing where we can deal with uh, terrible, terrible tragedy, terrible, terrible chaos, terrible, terrible, uh, you know, things that happen in, in our circles of influence. Right. Um, and so if someone dies out of a, a terrible accident, um, a, then we would know them by one or two degrees of separation and the community would band together and support each other in that moment and be like, wow, wasn't it a terrible thing that little Timmy got hit by the bus? Right. Because, because that's a thing. And, and, and now what's happening is if, if, if little Timmy um, gets hit by a bus in California and there's something about it that makes it um, just like tweak our justice filter. The whole world's going to know about it. And everybody's going to be outraged about little, little Timmy, how he died unfairly because of this thing that happened. And we need to change bus regulations because we're no longer just seeing the stuff that's in our, let's call it tribe. Right. And I don't mean that as a dirty word. Um, I actually mean that as a really important thing that right. are one to two degrees of, of certain, no, I, uh, it, of, of, it's, social. Right. Uh, no, I, I'm totally with you. I think that's a great example. And I think as part of that too, we also, we also filter it through our own lens as well. And yeah. so we look at that and we go, you know, if we are, if we already are, are concerned about those buses and we're like, well, these buses are, are a problem already. And then you see something like this happen. You're like, oh no, I've got to broadcast it to everyone and talk about yeah. how terrible this is. Whereas um, if instead say little Timmy got hit by, you know, a horse and buggy, or a crazy taxi. Or a crazy taxi that we talked about uh, last week. Um, <laughs> and, crazy and, Uber. Right. Oh, and, and you in no way, like th that's not even on your radar. You don't care about crazy taxis because you don't think that right. they're an issue. Exactly. You're going to ignore it. It's going to just be, it's going to be white noise. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's exactly also, that's another issue. Point. Right. Yeah. So exactly I, I'm, my point. I'm on board with you. So completely. I think what's happening here in the gaming space to bring it home is this. You log on to a random server of people you don't know who will never remember you and you don't care. Yeah. You act like a complete turd or a complete noob or anything in between and it doesn't matter you got your dopamine hit and you're gone right if instead you log onto a space that is a meaningful space where you actually know the people that are there and there's a, a real social interaction that's occurring and maybe there's some uh you know kind of nonverbals that are in and playing into this maybe there aren't but regardless you know there's going to be lasting social consequence potentially from this interaction. It changes the way you behave. So you're essentially referring to having a sense of community. Yes. Yes. And that's what I'm saying. I think we need to design the community back in. I think we've figured out how to make shooters really, really fun and mm -hmm. fast and crazy and adrenaline pumping and all that stuff. I think what we now have a huge gap for and what I think stuff like Overwatch League is really moving us towards is that idea of community again because now there are millions of fans who know or at least feel like they know these um, 
you know, these players who are these superstar players, these, yes. these twitchers who are superstar twitchers, uh, you know, and, and, and the let's players and, and et cetera, et cetera. But, but I think the key though, um, is to that sort of like, like feeling of community and that sort of, you know, the guidelines that might police that community, they have to come from within the community. And I think yeah. that's where, oh, Bl- yeah. I think that's where Blizzard failed is that they're trying to be the overseers determining right. what happens and trying no, to police that community. They make the community. tool, man. Right. They, 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 make they make the, the football. They make the ideas, they make the tools, and then the community itself They mow the lawn on the football field. Yeah. And then if, as that community, you, you choose to enter that space and yeah. you know the rules of that space. Yeah. And then you go, well, oops, I broke the rules of that space. Well, that was the spe- you know the rules. Yeah. That's the community has set those rules. <laughs> it's, like, right? it's like the Zamboni so, driver going, okay, that guy over there, yes. he messed up. He's off but the if team. someone from outside the community is setting those <laughs> rules that is trying to trying to police those, uh-huh. then, then the, the rules they might set may not may not mesh with the community. Yeah. Is, is yeah. the problem? Well, Blizzard does own and run the league. They can own and run anything they want. <laughs> I don't care. That's they're still not a part of the community. Right. So it's like, it's, uh, that's, that's kind of well, the point that's that we're not making. True. They are a part of the community, but they don't own and run and control the community. Fair enough. It's a subtle distinction, but I, so, I get yeah. what you're saying. Uh, and I think what really needs to happen then is somebody, an, a different blizzard. My, my point is you're uh, not going to get the backlash from the people uh, if they're- I'll make you really mad. Yeah. EA needs to step up and actually, because they've got the infrastructure to do this, um, have some leagues for some really fun games from some, some alternate competing things and then start changing the culture well, from the outside. But then first EA needs to make some really fun games. So <laughs> ouch. Star, Star Wars Battlefront two league. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, but that's my point. That's, that's exactly my point is that there are, there are other, sure. m- you know, megalithic game designers out there who can go, go blizzard. You don't know what you're talking about. Let me show you how you run a league. And then the, well, NBA 2K League. Yeah. Yes. You know what I'm saying? But that was, oh God, there's so many problems with that. There <laughs> are, but, but no, that's but, the point. Right. Is so, that we are, we are so, yes. all of us, I, I all think, of us are noobs yes. whenever it comes to league play. Yes. We don't know what we're doing. It's going to take us a while. Right. Imagine, imagine the first college, like basketball players, uh, you know, with their funny, stupid hats mm-hmm. or, or the, or, or baseball whenever it was really, really young or football before they were even knew that they needed to wear pads because they were going to die. Right. You know, I mean, no, I knew that's I, I, where we are. We're in the infancy. And I, I think that, that blizzard is a great example for this of, of, of not quite, or maybe just disconnecting from what they used to know. Because if you go back to the earlier days of world of Warcraft, there was a much blizzard that I used to know, but remember, I mean, you, you played world of Warcraft back in the day, right? <laughs> yeah. Doc? So oh, yeah. there was, there was a sense of community in world of Warcraft. Yeah, there really of course was. There was. And there was policing of that community within the community space. It yes, was, it was, it didn't feel like it was coming from outside but, of it or f- even from blizzard. I mean, blizzard helped there were to mods. moderate that community. Yes. However, it was the community that shaped what were, what was and was not well, for the most part. That's one of the with, cornerstones of new media. Right. And, and group think, I think it, ha- it runs that very, very dangerous thing whenever yes. you start uh, expecting everyone to behave the same. Because we're, we're not the same. No, no, no. I'm not, we're, we're not, not the behave same. the same, but which is why I think the smaller communities make more sense. I feel like, because we're, we're talking, we're kind of dancing around this. We talked mm-hmm. a lot about the smaller community space, the yeah. private lobbies a lot. And then we could have shifted at some point into these big gaming experiences. I don't know if you can do that with a big gaming experience. Well, it, it, you have clusters you of have grapes. To... The clusters of grapes are on vines. The vines are in yeah. vineyards uh, and the vineyards are in, uh, let's call them states. So what we're really talking about is trying to run California when all you really want is a glass of wine. Boom. Sure. Mic drop. Let's close on that. I like that. I yeah, think I'm going to okay. need some wine after this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here you go. <laughs> Yeah, so obviously a, a very, very big topic. And, you know, we could probably get a little bit more into um, maybe a future discussion on um, like how you do maybe design more for a sense of community or like, you know, we we barely even scratched the surface of how like Overwatch, um, you know, because we've been talking a lot about this and about Blizzard, um, the different things that they're trying to do within the game, um, like reporting tools and like, you know, uh, avoid as team bait is a new feature that just came out with recently. Like how how can you design community into a game that's not inherently about community i think i think that would be a great topic to discuss Mm -hmm. later on yeah and i'd love to discuss it within the context of old world of warcraft vanilla world of warcraft booty bay (laughs) yeah i'm not kidding oh great and i'm not kidding and i want to talk about why old vanilla world of warcraft booty bay despite all of the griefing Uh uh-huh actually had a great sense of community 
It was amazing. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a great that's, topic that for is later. A, that is yeah. a perfect example. And Doc knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know about. exactly yeah. what you're talking about. We could also apply it to Hillsbrad Caverns and yeah, other yeah. like uh, World PVP when yeah, they had it back very, in vanilla. Yeah. Very, very nice. Of course, you know, that's all going to be completely restored now that they're doing the retro servers. Well, it's going to be exactly it. like it was. I doubt it's it. It's going to be exactly hey, like <laughs> Given given the what Blizzard ha, how Blizzard has been handling Overwatch League, I'm going to have to say probably not, <laughs> right? No, seriously, probably yeah, not. So probably right. so maybe that I think is a great topic for later, possibly yeah. talking about some of these older spaces and why they worked, and maybe why some of the newer ones seem to be seem to actually have a lot more toxic individuals and talk. And what what's happened? We seem like we're police. These companies are policing it more, yet there's more toxic behavior. behavior. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that that is definitely seems yeah, to be happening. Great topic. There was less. And there was less policing, and it was more from the from with from within. And yet, now that there's much more from without, why is there so much more? It's because or, millennials are ruining video games. Well, no, I, or, I, I don't or, want. Or, I don't want to draw a conclusion. I, I think, no, I think we should say that because it's, it's, millennials this is a are very ruining video big games. Topic, That's what it is. right? Or is it maybe more that the problem was always there, but now that we're trying to fix it, we see it more? Well, as someone that played in those spaces, <laughs> I have knows. to say, no, it wasn't there more. I see it more now. Mm. So I'm just saying, I, why wasn't it there? Well, it is more popular now. So you have to account for that. If we see more of the information and we're not thinking about it in terms of percentage, but in terms of uh, instances, then yeah, there is more of it. Um, but that's that, that gets back to the Timmy Buzz problem again, mm -hmm. is that we, we're now, we're, le we're seeing it, we're learning it, we're turned on to hear it. Um, you know, man, well, but blood, it's, it's, blood it's a, leads, But man. it's about how you react to it. See, that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, it's I like agree. it's like you look at something and you go, oh, this is terrible. Look at these few examples, because that's what they do. They point out a few examples. Look oh, how terrible it is. Everybody's doing this. No, they're not. They're not. And then back in the day, it was those few people that were doing it, they're basically ostracized. Yeah, they were shunned. So, they weren't so, banned, they were shunned. Right, which is much worse than being banned, by the way, yeah. because when you're banned, you can just get a new account and come back and do it again as somebody else. Yeah. Anyway. We're, and with a vengeance, yes, no less. Yes, yes. And we're, we're getting a little off, but <laughs> final points, right? Mm. Uh well, we're all out of time. And of course, uh, you know, this Millennials is... Millennials are ruining time. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so... Um, and laundry. Oh, yeah. Playing the but time this, laundry. Right. this is quite obviously a very large topic <laughs> and um, one that we can keep discussing at length, but we are, uh, are as I said, out of time. But uh, we definitely want to hear from you uh, listeners, you know, if you have any thoughts on this or um, about anything kind of like related to what we discussed today. I'm definitely uh, interested to hear what you all have to say. So please uh, write into the show. Let us know. Yeah, please do. But until then, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com. And we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible. I don't hate millennials. Well, arguably we are millennials.